Okay, <clears throat> okay, welcome back. Sorry for the delay. Having a little bit of a technical problem. Anyway, I think I got us all. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Who, who can hear me? Yeah. Let me do another quick check. Bear with me. Okay. All right. Well, welcome back. Everything seems to be okay from my end. Um, just a, a quick note, just a reminder that on Tuesday, uh, exam number two, covering chapters uh, uh, three, four, and excuse me, four, five, and six. Okay. We'll be done with um, today. Number six, we'll be done with it and then uh, get you ready for next Tuesday. Similar format, <clears throat> you know, give yourself plenty of time. Uh, come Tuesday, if you have any questions, feel free to bring them in about those chapters. We can go over them. If not, I would just keep rolling with the chapters, okay? Um, let's see what else. Uh, uh, with respect, if you want to uh, visit with me as far as during my office time, uh, send me an email, tell me that you need some time and I'll make sure that I'm there for you. Remember, I set aside Tuesday and Thursday, three to four, uh, but it doesn't mean that I, I'm always there. And only if you guys send me something, if you need time, I, I will be there, okay? All right, any questions, comments, concerns? No, well, let me be, start off with where we ended up which was on slide number 19. Okay. There's one question. Thank you, Tessa, to take a moment. Yes, I tell you what, I can, uh, if you need to take the exam like a day ahead, no problem. Send me an, a request through Canvas email and uh, Tell me why you need to do that, and I shouldn't have a problem adjusting that. Okay. Oh, I, okay. So, uh, all right. so it yeah. need to be individual based, not the uh, like the class. Yes. Day. Yes. The whole class is on Tuesday. Okay. Uh, then I'll tr I'll try to do it on Tuesday then. Okay. If, I it, it will... if you, if... I have, I'm sorry. Please go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Because I have to go to work on Tuesday and then um, I get off at 4.30 and the class, the exam close at 10. That should be fine. Well, I just wanna... if, uh, it, this is for everybody. If, if, if you guys were working and it doesn't work out, like I said, I can go one day before, maybe one day after. So, but send me an email through, through, uh, uh, through Canvas. Okay, and, Thank you, sir. And, yeah. and, and explain the situation. If it's you know legitimate, no problem. I have a problem with doing that for you. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Sure. All right. So here we were talking about some trends in the periodic table. We had talked about um, sizes or the radius of these elements. Uh, keeping in mind that at going down the periodic table, the elements, the atoms themselves, increase in size. The radius increase. This, this is a kind of a, a general uh, trend that you can see going down the periodic table. Uh, the atoms got bigger and going from left to right, the radius got smaller. Now, you could be asked questions as why is, you know, for example, why this element here, sodium is, is bigger than say potassium and, and simply, simply because, you know, as you go one, two, Potassium is in the third energy level, uh, so its outermost layer is in the third energy level, and it's and it's just happens to be bigger. Okay, more energy levels is a bigger element, but in going from left to right, uh, you can see the general trend is that it gets smaller. And the question would be, well, why is let's say this one uh, uh, bigger than neon? Again, as we go across from left to right, we're in the same period. So it's not like you increase the energy level, you're in the same energy level. 
And so what's increasing as you go from left to right is the number of protons and the number of electrons. And as you increase the number of protons and electrons, there's more nuclear force being involved there. Uh, make it analogous to, I start off with two magnets, you know, that's quite a bit of force put together. And, but then I, I end up with four, five, six magnets and that force gets pretty strong, okay? The result is that that force and that nuclear force in pulls those electrons further in on the outermost shell and thus these guys to the right tend to be smaller, okay? Because of that. Now, that being the case, the question will be well, which is larger? And to answer that, you first have to identify the elements and where they are with respect to the periodic table to help you out. It is not necessary to sit there and memorize the, the radius for every single element. No, it's not what we don't want you, we want you to do. We, you know, given the 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 thread the thread uh, the how I remember we state that. It's been a long afternoon. Given what is the explanation we had, uh, be able to answer the question. So we got three here, and the first thing we need to do is identify them in the product table. Well, it turns out that all of them are in group 6A, okay? And so um, obviously there, we're moving down the periodic table, and obviously EE is much larger because it's a larger energy level as far as the valence electron. It's a bigger, bigger element. Now, with respect to the next group, uh, again, we could identify them on the product table. And we can see here, we got magnesium here on the left. And then way in the far right, we have uh, sulfur. So one, one, one thing is they're in the same period. They're in the same energy level. So we can't talk about different energy levels because they're on the same energy level. The difference is going from, from here to here, Sulfur has more protons and more electrons, resulting in a stronger nuclear force. Okay. And therefore, sulfur then will be smaller than magnesium and silicon because of that. All right. <laughs> more electrons are being pulled. The electrons are being pulled stronger for sulfur as compared to magnesium and silica. All right, so be sure to watch the video from Dr. Kim uh, on dealing with atomic size and uh, get, get an alternative uh, source with respect to this topic. All right, now, what we're gonna talk about now is what is called ionization energy, okay? Now, all that is, is nothing complicated here, okay? If we break down the word right there, ionization, basically what we're doing is we're making something into an ion. Remember, an ion is an element that has lost or gained electron. In this particular example, though, we are making positive ions because we are what we're doing, we're putting energy into the element and we're trying to remove, remove an electron. Okay. And that is denoted by this process right here, where we had sodium, element of sodium, undergoing ionization to create the ion plus an electron, okay? So looking at this process and, and thinking about what we talked about, here's a couple of things to keep in mind. One, metals want to lose electrons, okay? With that being said, that would it suggest that metals in general would give up electrons readily as compared to nonmetals that want to gain electrons. Now, if you go across the product table, remember the radius got smaller because we have more nuclear charge. Those elements are holding on to their electrons even uh, much greater than the, the elements preceding them, okay? So we can anticipate that nonmetals would want, would have a higher energy ionization energy than metals because nonmetals want to gain electrons. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is you go down the periodic table, specifically specifically the A elements, they, what they all have in common is they all have the same number of valence electrons. But, okay, but think of this. 
when you compare the valence electron of a small element compared to a large element in the same group, well, the one, the larger element has its valence electrons further away. So there's not a lot of interaction between the, the nucleus and that is strong, I should say, than uh, the interaction between the nucleus and the outermost electron for a large element compared to a smaller one. So I would anticipate that the ionization for uh, a small element within the same group would be much greater than one for a larger one, okay? And that would help us be able to put some perspective on this whole process of ionization energy. All right, so as, let me back up. As we go from, uh, go down the periodic table, okay? or up the periodic table, let's go with the book. As you go up the periodic table, the ionization energy increases, okay? Well, let us, let me um, pull up the periodic table, okay? And, and for this purpose, let's look at say sodium versus uh, uh, potassium. Okay, now the ionization energy goes up as we go up the periodic table, okay? Now, what sodium and potassium have in common is that they're in the same group and have one valence electron. What they don't have in common is this. Sodium is in the third energy level, okay? It, it has three energy levels, one, two, and three, where the last, the valence electron is occupied in the third energy level. Compared to potassium, where it, it's, it, ha, it has four energy levels, where the last, the valence electron is in the fourth energy level, meaning that that lone electron for potassium is further away than that for sodium. Therefore, the electron for potassium that's further away would be readily be removed compared to sodium whose lone electron is closer in. You know, if I were if I were the sodium atom, for example, just to, get, to demonstrate what I'm saying, that valence electron could be, let's say for argument's sake, a mile away, okay? And for potassium, if I was potassium, maybe its electron would be, say, four miles away. So you can see the, the potassium valence electrons further away. So there's less interaction with the nucleus and that electron further away. So potassium's electron would be readily more removable than sodium, okay? And that's what they're saying right here. Now, when you go from left to right, the ionization energy goes, okay? So you're within the same period, but the ionization goes up as you go from left to right. Back to the periodic table. And if, for example, we were comparing, oh, I don't know, you just say carbon and oxygen. Okay, they are both in the same energy level as far as their valence electrons and the outermost shell is two. And so it's not like going down the periodic table, it's on the same period. The difference is uh, oxygen has two more protons, two more electrons, increasing that nuclear force, okay? And so it's pulling those electrons much closer with a greater force than carbon is. Okay, so the ionization energy for oxygen would be greater than that for carbon, just like the radius for oxygen would be smaller for oxygen compared to uh, carbon, okay? For the same reason, because of the nuclear force involved in pulling in the electrons tightly. Oh, sorry about that, I killed the... Plus, 
That being the case, the other aspect to remember is that metals would be anticipated to have low ionization energy because by default, they want to lose electrons. That's their tendency, losing electrons compared to nonmetals that want to hold on to electrons and gain electrons. And therefore, nonmetals would be would have a higher ionization and energy compared to metals. Now, if we were to look at uh, the ionization energy of the elements and to plot out, plot out their data, we would see that uh, starting from the first element, which is hydrogen right here, shooting across to helium, okay? that the ionization for hydrogen is say roughly, I don't know, about 13 and a half energy units, 13.5. Okay, energy units. And then when you measure the ionization for helium, it's already kicked up to about 24 and a half ballpark, okay, in energy units. So it greatly increased going from the far left of the product table to the far right, right? Now, when we wrap it around and go to lithium, lithium's right here, the ionization energy dropped just a little bit above five units. And then as we go across from lithium all the way across to neon, there's a little fluctuation up and down, but the general trend is ionization energy increases until we hit neon and neon's roughly about 22 energy units. So that's going across the periodic table. As we go across the periodic table, we increase the number of protons, increase the number of electrons. They hold on to electrons are much greater, all right? Plus, we start getting getting the nonmetals in this particular region, so we expect the ionization energy to go up. Then, once we get in neon, we go away all, all the way around the horn, so to speak, and we drop back down to sodium. And obviously, sodium here, you can see ionization energy goes back to metal, ballpark around five units of energy. And then across the periodic table, all the way across the argon, the energy goes up. Process repeats, and then we got potassium right here. Okay. And then ionization as you go across to krypton increases. Now notice that the, the, um, the slope of the line starts off very steep in the beginning with hydrogen and helium. And then as we get bigger and bigger, the slope begins to slow down here. And then we're straightening up a little bit. Okay. To eventually that if we were continue that we essentially get a, basically a straight line, see very little difference. And that makes sense because as you get to the bigger, bigger elements, those electrons that are further away, regardless of metal, non-metal, they're further away because they're long. They're in six, seven, eight, uh, uh, six and seven energy level. And so those electrons are further away, regardless of what type of metal or what type of element they are. And so they tend to have uh, their ionization energy is essentially the same. It's still a little bit higher from the nonmetals, but not that much difference, just because of the size of the atom. But initially, in the beginning, you can see the trend okay? of going from left to right. All right, so questions that could be asked just like the radius would be, all right, who has the higher or the larger IE ionization energy and why? Well, we answer these questions just like we did with the radius. First, we have to identify them on the periodic table, okay? And so here we got magnesium, aluminum, and uh, chlorine. Now, point number one, the fact that you have one nonmetal relative to two nonmetals, you shouldn't be able to answer that question quickly. Why? Because chlorine is a nonmetal. And remember, nonmetals have a tendency to gain electrons, so they will not give up their electrons as readily as the metals which are aluminum. So by that, chlorine would have a larger ionization energy. And if you forget about that difference, then you look at the periodic table, you can see that chlorine has a lot more protons than the electrons. 
Therefore, its nuclear force is much greater than the other two that were being asked to evaluate. And therefore, the ionization energy would be much greater for chlorine for that reason. Okay. All right. So, all right. Second set is this group of elements. We need to identify them, find out. Uh, here in this case, all three of them are, are metals. So we can't think, well, there's a non-metal here and that would answer that question quickly. But here we got three metals. So we have to actually find them on the product table and they happen to be all of them in group 1A. Okay, so meaning they all have one valence electron. The difference is good old RB here is much larger, okay? Much larger because it's in one, two, three, four, five. It is, its valence electron is in the fifth energy level, right? So that means that it is, its electrons are being held on much loosely, I should say, compared to say lithium where its lone electron is closer to the nucleus, so it's being held on a little bit tighter than RB, okay? Because lithium is smaller and it's holding on its electrons much tighter than the larger atoms. All right. So be sure to watch the videos on this topic, okay? Got a couple more and we'll be done with this particular chapter. All right, we talked about what's called ionization energy. Ionization energy deals, again, to refresh your memory, is the amount of, amount of energy required to remove an electron from an atom, okay? Not to be confused with this called quantity, uh, property, which is called electronegativity. Now, this is an important concept because it keeps, it keeps coming back over and over again. It just explains a lot about the properties of chemical compounds, okay? And what this is, is it is a measure of the affinity or the ability of an atom to attract to itself bonded electrons. Now, we're going to talk in the next chapter about the type of bonds that we have. So for, for EN, uh, we're only going to be talking about one type of bond. There's only two types of bond. One's called ionic bond. The other one's called a covalent bond, all right? And this is EN, it, what pertains to is for those covalent bonds. That is a, a, an example would be, let's say, carbon and hydrogen. They have a bond between them denoted by that line. In that line represents two electrons, and this is a single bond, okay? Now, unlike, say, sodium chloride, where sodium is an ion with a full positive charge and chloride is an ion with a full negative charge, and they come together by mutual attraction, what we call electrostatic attraction, the covalent bond does not. The covalent bond is actually pairing electrons and creating a true bond. We call that a molecular bond or a covalent bond. It is only under these type of conditions that we have this property called electronegativity. Okay. And that is a measure of an element's affinity for electrons in a bonded uh, environment in a bonded system. Now, of all the elements, we have fluorine. We're gonna put a button right here. Is the most electronegative element there, okay? That's our benchmark. This, this is how who we use to determine if we are comparing who has a greater electronegativity is we compare it to their relative position on the product table to fluorine because fluorine is the most electronegative. For example, if we look, let's say carbon is right here and nitrogen is right here, okay? The trend is from left to right, it increases from the bottom of the periodic table up for fluorine, the electronegativity increases. But what if we had a bond between 
carbon and the nitrogen. Okay. Well, first, first thing is that this bond is being shared. That's correct. But there's an unequal sharing. And the reason there's an unequal sharing is because the electronegativity and of carbon and nitrogen are different. And there's going to be an unequal sharing of that bond. That bond's not going to be, not going to be broken up like ionic compounds, where it's not really a bond. It's going to be an unequal sharing. If I have a carbon and a carbon bond, the fact that they are the same element means that that bond between them is equally distributed. There's an equal sharing. There's no pull of those electrons because you got carbons on the left and the right. When you replace that carbon with another element, automatically now you get unequal sharing. And we need to learn, we will need to learn, well, which direction is that pull going to? What we do is we find the position of those two elements relative to fluorine. And in this scenario, nitrogen is closer to fluorine. Therefore, when compared to carbon, nitrogen is a more electronegative of the, uh, between carbon and nitrogen. And therefore, nitrogen will pull that electronegativity, due to electronegativity, will pull the electrons onto itself. And it will make an uneven bond Okay, very specific type, type of bond, which we'll discuss here in a bit. Okay, so this concept, this concept of electronegativity is extremely important. And that is why, because of electronegativity differences in the bond, we are able to create new compounds. It's very difficult to make new compounds when there is no uh, difference in the bond. Uh, and soon to be clear here, when we get more and more detail about that particular bond. But furthermore, because we have an unequal sharing between carbon and nitrogen in that molecule, it's going to have a specific type of bond, which then affects the specific properties of the whole molecule, which then tells us whether it could be soluble in a certain type of solvent or not, which can also tell us Okay, when I compare two compounds, which one will have a higher boiling point? Which one will boil or melt at higher temperature? Things, different properties that we're gonna we're gonna learn about and when we do a compare and contrast. And all of that is great is 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 directed back to electronegativity. Okay, so this concept is 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 very important and really we really need to hammer it in in you with respect to chemistry all right so um normal gases of course they don't have no electronegativity because one you know they don't form bonds okay they have the octet full and uh they're not going to do anything so with that being said congratulations we got one more chapter down off chapter seven, six. Okay. All right. So let us continue. Any questions before I begin? Okay. Well, this brings us <clears throat> to chemical bond. Now, may have mentioned this before, but there are only two types of chemical bonds that we, we deal with. They're, they're out there in chemistry. And those two types are dependent on uh, which two elements come together. And they're dependent on which is a metal, which is a non-metal. And so I suggest you go back to the chapter that we did about properties of these elements so we can be able to determine who's a metal and who's a non-metal. If you forget, remember, use the periodic table because on that stair step, that stair step that we see here, that tells us right there 
we got metals over here with the exception of hydrogen, and then we got non-metals on this side, okay? So, and that's important to know which, which, which one is which, because we're gonna utilize that quite a bit when it comes to these chemical bonds. Okay. Also, let me pull that up. If you haven't done so already, hopefully you've done this way back in the beginning of the semester, um, make sure you download and print out the shapes table, okay? Because we're gonna use the shapes table. And what that does is, is this, it's gonna help us determine the molecular geometry of the molecules. You know, here we are, we starting, we started to, um, we started out the semester with talking about uh, some general information about chemistry and so forth. Then we got into calculations and we did that for a reason because we're gonna use that technique of how we did the calculations down the road here when we start talking about calculations with uh, chemical reactions. But then we got into the elements and we start learning about the elements, which are metals, nonmetals, which ones want to lose electrons, gain electrons. We talked about the valence electrons, what kind of charge they're going to, the elements going to have when they lose uh, the number of lose or gain electrons. Okay. So we start learning about that. We're going to start taking that information and putting compounds together. All right. Now, once we put the compounds together, the next step is to actually come up with a geometry of these compounds. And we're also going to be, uh, be uh, well, we'll learn more here in a second. From how these compounds are put together, we're going to create what's called the general formula, denoted by the letters of A, B, and E. Okay. A, B, and E. And A is, there's only, only going to be one A. There's always a central atom. Okay. So A represents the central atom. B represents how many species or how many elements are bonded to, how, how many elements are bonded to the central atom, okay? And then E represents what we call the lone pair of electrons. They're denoted by two dots. What we're going to find is on some compounds, there's going to be a pair or two pair of what we call lone pair of electrons on the central atom. Okay. With that general formula, we're going to come up. Here's the general formula. We're going to come up either with the AB2 or uh, AB2E, etc. And let's take this one here, AB4, which is probably the most common geometry for compounds. AB4 is we have a central atom, which we, this is A, and then we got four Bs wrapped, uh, bonded to the central atom. Okay. Keeping this in mind that this line represents two electrons. And we just draw a line to represent a bond. Now, given the fact that electrons are negative charge, right? There's four of them around the central atom. Those electrons are going to repel each other, okay? Such that they're in the configuration where you got the maximum repulsion from each other and they're away from each other. And they end up with this three-dimensional picture. We call that a tetrahedral configuration, named for the shape, okay? And the bond angle represents uh, the, diff the bond angle between Bs that are bonded to the central atom. So this 109.5 degrees is the bond angle between the two moieties that are bonded to the central atom. Now 109.5 generally tends to be the most standard bond angle out there for compounds. Now what can happen, depending on your general form and structure, is that you can have Instead of three, in this case, two bonds, you can have a lone pair on the central atom. That is, you got two electrons sitting here, denoted by these two dots here, that are not bonded to anything. They're just sitting on the central atom. 
And here you have one pair, but you can have, um, let me clear this up here. You can have two pair. Here in this case, you've got two pair right here. You've got one pair. But that has a big effect on the geometry. We start off with this kind of a benchmark. And if we were to take this B off, we end up with a lone pair. That's going to have an effect on the overall structure because lone pairs tend to occupy more space. Note, there's two negative charges here. And they're going to repel each other. So they're going to have an effect on that bond angle, which now this went from 109. And, and in this example, it went to a less than 109. That in turn has an effect on the properties of the molecule, OK? Big time effect on the properties of the molecule. All right, so we're going to take that information, generate the general formula, uh, get the geometry, get the name of that geometry, and that particular bond angle. And we do that using the shape state. Okay, so make sure you print that out. Okay. Now, in all of this here, the ultimate goal, and we demonstrated, we demonstrated that when we were showing valence electrons and we were showing the metals and nonmetals, what was happening when we did the electron configuration, what was happening to the valence shell. The ultimate goal was to get eight electrons around its valence shell. That does not discontinue because that's carried over to our chemical structures here. Now, the magical number is eight, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen always will have two maximum, okay? Always. And so, for example, if we were to look at carbon, and carbon's a central atom, and if we had it bonded to two, four hydrogens, now I'm going to draw, try to attempt to do a kind of a three-dimensional picture given two-dimensional space. Okay, that wedge here represents that bond coming out of the plane of the screen. These two, this one and this one, are in the plane of the screen. And then that hash mat mark is a hydrogen going to the back of the plane. So that gives you a kind of a three-dimensional perspective. Okay? Um, in that bond, all four bonds here, okay, general form is AB4 here. The Bs happen to be hydrogen and they're bonded to the central atom, which is carbon. You'll always be told who the central atom is. You'll never have to sit there and guess who's, which one is central atom. So in this scenario, if you look at this, we are, there are four lines or bonds around carbon. Every line has, every bond has two hydrogens, two electrons. So we got two electrons here, two electrons here, two here, and two here. So if you look at carbon by itself, guess what? There's a total of eight electrons around carbon. They're, they are being shared with hydrogen. Now, hydrogen, its row is a duet. Okay? You would never see more than one bond on hydrogen. Always there would be only singly one bond. And there's two electrons that are being shared between the carbon and the hydrogen. And those two electrons are split. They count toward the carbon and they count toward the hydrogen. Hydrogen. So the duet is, is covered there. The duet for hydrogen is fulfilled. And the octet for carbon is fulfilled because eight of them are being shared around the carbon. Okay. And that's what we mean about the octet rule, specifically in, in a bond. Now, we've talked at this at length. Metals lose electrons and become cations, and nonmetals gain electrons and become anions. Okay. And so the first type of chemical bond or compound that we're going to deal with is called an ionic compound or an ionic bond. And that is. contributed to the coming together of a metal and a non-metal. And so when we look at a formula like NaCl, 
that is sodium chloride. Okay, we know that sodium is a metal. Okay, and chloride is a non-metal. Okay. Let me double check here. Okay, here's chloride and sodium was way down there to the left. Here's the chloride and here's sodium, okay? So we have a metal and non-metal. Therefore, we have an ionic bond, which is not really a bond, okay? It's kind of misleading, but the term bond is utilized because what's happening here is we have an ion sodium with a full positive charge and the chloride with a full negative charge, okay? Opposites attract. So those two guys, bam, come together. There's no sharing of electrons, they're just sitting here. Now, one property about these ionic compounds is that when we put them in water, guess what they do? They tend to dissociate and break apart. Some of them dissociate and break apart 100%, some of them maybe 5%, but they, all of them, regardless of the magnitude of separation, do separate, okay? Unlike covalent compounds, all right? Oh, <laughs> there's some examples right here. A right, quick word before I go on covalent. Notice you have a combination of, uh, you have a question here about the calcium ion and the lithium ion. Now, remember this, when you're dealing with ionic compounds, you would never see two positives coming together to form a compound, nor you will find two negatives coming together to form a compound. It's always a positive and a negative scenario, okay? So there are some examples of uh, ionic compounds, potassium chloride, calcium bromide, okay? You might see here and think, oh, yeah, look, I got, I got, a, I got calcium bromide. You might be tempted to think diatomic. Now, versus this system, okay? Now, before I proceed, let me explain. Notice that calcium is written first. That is a flag to tell you, I have a compound here. And calcium, normally the first person, normally the metal is written down first, okay? And normally, normally the metal is the central atom. And so the fact that you see calcium here is not mean because you got a two here that is diatomic. It just means that there are two bromides for every one calcium, not, not diatomic. If it was diatomic, there'd be nothing in front of here. It would just be BR2. All right. Uh, when we have a combination of two non-metal, We have a covalent compound with covalent bonds. Look at the term covalent, co and valent. We're talking about valence electrons because that's where the action is happening. But there is a sharing of these valence electrons, okay? And unlike the ionic bonds that I told you that once we place them in water that they will dissociate some in variety of rare, a various number of degrees of dissociation, but they would dissociate nevertheless. Covalent compounds, when you put them in water, they do not break apart. They do not dis dissociate. They remain intact. The bond between them is a true bond, okay? It is a true sharing of electrons. Unlike the ionic bonds, it is more of what, what's called an electro, Static attraction. When it comes to ionic bonds. Right. So, so examples of covalent bonds given here. Obviously, all the diatomic compounds are covalent. 
and then things like water, H2O, and carbon dioxide. Okay. Um, normally, like I stated, when even if ionic compounds where the metal is written first, they generally is a central atom. Uh, when it comes to covalent compounds, the first uh, element written, like carbon dioxide, normally is the central atom. The only exception is H2O. By convention, they put hydrogen first. It does not mean hydrogen is the central atom. H2O, oxygen, is always the central atom. But you'll always be told who the central atom is, okay? You, you won't have to sit there and figure it out. All right. So question is, why is the formula for calcium bromide written as follows, okay? Which is telling you that you have one calcium and two bromides. Well, that's because when we are given the name and, or we want to figure out what's going on here for this formula, well, if you write them in ionic form first, you will see that the calcium has a plus two charge. And the bromides each have a negative one charge. Okay. But that comes again from knowing their position, the elements that is, knowing their position in the periodic table, and then being able to determine what their charge would be when they become ions. Okay. Bromine is in group seven, it's a non metal, it's going to gain an electron. Okay, so it ends up with a negative one charge. Potassium is the group 2A. It's a metal. It's going to lose electrons, specifically those two valence electrons. Okay. So then, once you get a ionic form, when put this, write this down, this general formula, the number of cations plus the number of anions must equal zero when we're putting together ionic compounds, okay? So the number of cations plus the number of anions must equal to zero. So knowing the potassium, excuse me, calcium has a plus two, okay? And bromide has a negative one, means that we're gonna need two bromides to cancel the positive two of calcium. And this two becomes the subscript or the bromides, okay, that's their formula. So you, you'll be asked given if, and for example, you could be asked to, you be given the name sodium bromide and ask what is the formula? Okay, we just went through it. Well, when, that, when they give you the name, the first thing you gotta do is put them in ionic form first so you know how many positives and negatives you need to put them together to write the formula, okay? Or you could be given the formula and you want, and you're asked to give the name. So whichever direction, we, you need to be able to go in both directions here. With respect, give me the name, I need the formula, given the formula, give it the name, okay? All right, so this, this conversation, oh, uh, hydrogen, for example, never, like I, state, I did state that hydrogen would never have two, two, more than two bonds onto itself, okay? Always one bond. Now, the question here is you have a list of compounds. Granted, you don't know what they are. I'll tell you what they are here in a bit. But you're asked the question, uh, which of these in this list are ionic? Okay. Well, to answer that, you know, you go back to the definition of ionic. And that is a combination of a metal and a non-metal. Okay. Now, then you may need to go back further and look at the and look at the uh, periodic table to determine which ones are metals and which ones are non-metals. Okay. All right. So we go through each one, and you can see potassium bromide. Well, obviously potassium is the metal, so obviously that is ionic. S 
sulfur and oxygen. Both of them are nonmetals. That's definitely not ion gas. That is um, um, covalent. Then we got hydrogen and chloride, again, two nonmetals. And then we got the diatomic bromine, two nonmetals. And then we got carbon dioxide, again, two nonmetals. So those are not uh, ionic at all. And finally, at the end, we got magnesium, which is a metal, and then Cl2, which is a nonmetal. So definitely the only two in this list, which are ionic, are potassium bromide, which is the top one. I'm going to go ahead and give, start giving you names. Potassium bromide. Okay. And this one is magnesium chloride. Okay. That means that the, what's left are covalent compounds. Okay, now we don't need to know what they are at this point in time, but I'm going to give them to you. This one here, SO3, is called sulfur. Okay, sulfur because sulfur is the central atom. And if it was afterwards, another atom, then followed by sulfur, and then it would be called sulfide. But here, sulfur is the first atom, so therefore, it is sulfur, and then what follows is oxygen, which are bonded, which in ionic or covalent, the name still gets converted to oxide. But more importantly, because we're dealing with covalent compounds, it is trioxide. Okay. Notice down here, we didn't name that magnesium dichloride. So the takeaway from here is this. For ionic compounds, when it comes to naming, no prefixes, okay? No prefixes for ionic compounds. For covalent compounds, yes on the prefixes. And you have sulfur trioxide. And then this one here is uh, uh, hydrochloric acid. Okay. It's also called hydrogen chloride. The difference being whether we are in the water or not. Uh, let me back up here for the sulfur trioxide. This one here, if you ever get it behind a vehicle and, and you and the vehicle takes off and you smell rotten eggs, smell, that's what you're smelling from the vehicle, sulfur trioxide. The bad thing about that is this this is uh, is gas that gets up to the atmosphere. It uh, eventually gets into the clouds, reacts with moisture up there to eventually form sulfuric acid, which is a strong acid, but a strong acid. And then when it rains, it comes back down, it goes back to earth, changes the pH of the soil, causing more metals, hazardous metals to go in solution, get into the water table. Big old mess, okay? All right, the next one, hydrogen chloride. You should be very familiar with this one because you carry it around with you 24 seven. That is the acid that's in your stomach, hydrogen chloride. And then this one is simply called bromine. And then of course, you know, carbon dioxide. Notice the prefix di because it is a covalent compound, okay? Dioxide. If that was CO, that would be carbon monoxide, okay? All right, so of this set, only two of them are ionic compounds, and we identified them because of the combination of the metal and the nonmetal. Now, with respect to ionic uh, bonding, we have a scenario here where you have the sodium atom, Okay, which has a loss in the electron because it is a metal. And then you got the chlorine atom right here, which has gained an electron because it is a nonmetal. Okay, the result, one result is this. If you look at that diameter, which is kind of representative of what's happening, by losing that one valence electron, one electron out there in the valence shell, it becomes much smaller. So 
is sodium now, it's sodium ion, okay? And the chlorine, which is gain in the electron now is much larger in diameter because it picked up more uh, negative an electron, which occupies more space because all the electrons now are repelling each other, okay? But they're not bonded together. You know, you can see here, it's just an attraction, this electrostatic attraction and end up in a very crystalline ordered state shown there on the right. All right. Uh, all right, let's consider, look, there's a little bit of a rehash here. Okay, we have, you know, we've gone through some other ones like this. We know that, for example, uh, magnesium, the atom versus the ion. In both cases, they have 12 protons. Where they differ is in the number of electrons, right? So the magnesium ion has lost two electrons and given us a plus two charm. Sulfur being non-metal, okay, will gain two electrons. So in both cases, the atom and the ion both have 16 protons. Where they differ is in the number of electrons where the ion has picked up uh, two electrons and has 18, okay? Now, at this point, we can put them together to write a formula and we put magnesium ion plus the sulfide. Notice the name change went from sulfur to sulfide because now it's an ion. The fact that there's an equal number of charges, a plus two and a negative two means that we can put them together as a one-to-one. -one. So the formula for this compound would be MGS or magnesium, Sulfide, sulfide, not sulfur. Sulfur would be the element. Sulfide would be the ion, okay? All right, so we make an ionic compound and making these ionic bonds, bonds, which I wish we had a different name rather than bonds because as I demonstrated there in the picture, they're not really sharing anything, just a mutual attraction between a positive and a negative charge. All right, uh, recap on ionic, ionic uh, electrons, um, excuse me, recap on uh, ionic size. You know, cations have lost electrons, so they have more protons now, and therefore what electrons are, they have left, hold them even, even greater. Okay, plus they lost that outermost shell that they had to begin with, that valence shell. So now the next shell in is the new valence shell, which would generally be full with eight electrons. Uh, the anions have gained electrons and therefore there's more electrons on, on the orbital because generally they start off with room to pick up three to two, one more electron. And that results in these orbits being pushed away and from each other more so. And so therefore their radius is bigger, okay? And so we have, we can answer some of the questions here. Can we pause question? Question says here, the aluminum atom loses electrons. Now, there's a multi multiple questions here. If anything is, is if they're both true, then it's true. If one is false and the other one's true, then the answer is false, right? They all gotta be correct. Okay. The aluminum atom loses electrons and the iodine atom gains electrons. Is that a true state? What do you guys think? Okay. Aluminum, is that a metal or non-metal? It's a metal. Okay, good, Ellie. Now, would it lose electrons?
Ooh, yes, we got a no and a yes. <laughs> okay, step back. What do metals want to do? They want to lose electrons. If that's true, then what do non-metals want to do? They want to gain electrons. This statement is a true statement, okay? The aluminum atom is larger in radius than the aluminum ion. What do you guys think of this? So we're looking at the atom and comparing it to the ion. Keep in mind what happens to create an ion. It lost electrons. So what do you think about the radius? It's true. This is a true statement. That's correct, Thomas. Okay. Next question says the iodine atom. You go. You got to read the questions carefully. The iodine atom is smaller in radius than the iodide ion. What do you think? Yeah, I would think that this is also true. Remember, because the atom, the iodine atom, which is a nonmetal, gain an electron. And by gaining electrons, it makes the radius bigger. Okay? So that's a true statement. And then finally, the aluminum and the iodide ions form a bond by attraction. And that is true because they form ions with a full charge, okay? And they are attracted together just like analogous to uh, magnets coming together, okay? Unlike covalent bonds, that they come together and they share they share electrons. Uh, we're not going to say much about metallic bonding, other than to say that the metals themselves are just basically a whole sea of electrons all over the surface, and and uh, that being the case, you know they're very good good uh, uh, conductors of electricity, and therefore also good conductors of heat. Which brings us to covalent bonding. Now, covalent bonding, remember, it is a combination of a nonmetal, an M, and a nonmetal. Okay. And what results in that combination is what we call a bond, a true bond. And there's three types of bonds there is a single bond that we denote by a line. Okay, so I got A bonded to A, for argument's sake. I can denote it as a line. And it's the same thing as putting two dots. Okay, These, that's the same thing. Because that line represents two electrons. Every single bond has two electrons. There are examples of what, what are called double bonds, okay? And so in that double bond, we have four electrons, two lines. Each line has two electrons. And then we have one more. And that is a triple bond. Okay. And again, each line represents two electrons. So we have a total of six electrons. So you can see drawing the lines is much quicker and faster trying to deal with all those dots, okay? But I, I put the dots up to demonstrate that. So we have double, uh, a single, double, and triple bonds in covalent uh, bonds, in covalent compounds, okay? We're going to learn that, for example, carbon dioxide will have this type of a structure. Okay, I'm going to put a line. And the lines I put on the oxygens represent a lone pair of electrons. And then you notice that there is a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen on the right side. And then that there's a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen on the left side. If you count the lines around carbon, guess what? There are eight electrons or bonds. If you count the, the lines around the, each oxygen, you'll find that there are four electrons here in the double bond are being shared with carbon, but then you will find these lone pair. Remember we talked about lone pair? 
These are lone pair of electrons that are on the oxygen themselves are not bonded to anything. So tally that up, guess what? The octet has been fulfilled for the oxygen. And the same is true for the oxygen on the left side, okay? Um, H2O, oxygen, is the central atom. And that is bonded to two hydrogens with a single bond. Remember, single bond only for hydrogens, which means that there are two lone pair of electrons on the oxygen. Remember, we got to fulfill the octet. The oxygen has eight electrons around it in water. Two of them are bonded, two pairs are bonded, and two pairs are lone pair. And then the hydrogen has two electrons around it because its duet rule has been fulfilled, okay? Now we're gonna start learning how to uh, create these bonds. We're gonna be looking at valence electrons. So keep this in mind. Make sure you know how you can calculate, determine the number of valence electrons for the element, where you can find that information from the product table, because you're going to need that information to tally up the number, total number of valence electrons for a compound. And that information will allow us to create bonds for a compound. And then the octet rule or duet rule will allow us to put in single bonds only or maybe a double bond or a triple bond to make sure that everybody's been fulfilled. And once we got that down, we go and uh, uh, create the general formula for that compound. Once we know that, we go to the shades table and determine the geometry and the bond angle and so forth, okay? A lot of steps, but I'm gonna walk you through it. Everything is systematic approach. You go boom, bang, bang, stepwise. Hopefully you won't get lost, okay? But we'll, we'll, we'll go systematic. And my, my, my approach is always for any problem solving, systematic approach, one step at a time until you become comfortable. And then, you know, you can uh, move on and get to the answer at your, your own rate. So bear with me if I sound redundant. If I'm redundant on, on certain things, it's for a reason. It must be important, okay? Um, normally, as, as a general guideline, if you're talking face-to-face, -face, you know, we were in person, you know, normally when a professor instructor writes something on the board, hmm, maybe it's important. Or if he repeats it a couple of times, that could be important. Okay, so I, uh, if I'm writing something down, uh, I would tell you, hey, this is something we need to really grasp and hold on to and put in long-term memory, all right? All right, so multiple covalent bonds. Uh, I just talked about that. In single bond are two electrons, double bonds are four electrons, and triple bonds are six electrons, okay? Now, with respect to strength, uh, Energy-wise, the single bonds are probably are are the weakest compared to a triple bond. Okay, uh, for example, a butane. If you have a lighter at home, you're gonna flick your bit. Okay, inside that lighter is a hydrocarbon called butane, made up of nothing but single bonds. We got four carbons bonded there, and then all hydrogens around it. On the outside carbons, we've got three hydrogens. And then the ones inside, there are two hydrogens. And then three hydrogens outside. Anyway, that's butane. Nothing but single bonds, OK? We can have another acetylene, acetylene compound, which is made up of a triple bond hydrocarbon, that is a carbon with a triple bond. This is the structure for acetylene. This guy here, mixed with oxygen, is hot enough to cut metal. This one is not, okay? This one can light your cigarettes for you, but it's not gonna, not gonna uh, burn, cut down a, a steel building with compared to acetylene and the oxygen. So, uh, 
triple bonds are the shortest and tend to be the strongest and tend to have a lot more energy. All right, well, I tell you what I'm gonna do. Uh, I got, which slide are we on? We are on 13. Let us stop here. I got a couple minutes left, I'm not stopping. We will stop on slide 13. All right.